Welcome to The Thought Hackers, the show where you will learn how your mind works and discover how to change your thinking from leading experts and through inspiring stories. Good day, everyone. My name is Nathan Siegel. I'm with my colleague Hamish Baston out of Australia, and we are The Thought Hackers. With us today is a fellow by the name of Nick Arquette. Nick founded an organization called Walk with Sally in 2005, and he named it for his mother, who had been diagnosed with breast cancer and after many years of treatment, died when Nick was 16. And after attending both the American Conservatory Theater and Boise State University, Nick moved to Manhattan Beach 25 years ago to pursue a career in the film industry and has worked as a professional actor ever since. For the past 20 years, Nick has been a broker to this industry, negotiating deals for major productions, shooting on location in LA and throughout the United States. In 2011, Nick was awarded as Citizen of the Year by MB Chamber Women in Business and was a finalist for the Daily Breeze Most Philanthropic in 2012. So Nick, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Our pleasure. So, um, yeah, so in terms of what happened, you, you were saying that your, your mother had been diagnosed with cancer, and I think you said at the age of 11 is when this began, correct? Yeah, you know, I, being a fifth grader and just wanting to be normal, we had a unique situation. My brother Alex and I were being raised in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, um, by a single mom. And ultimately, um, that was an opportunity for my mom to really have a home. She worked two jobs, um, and things were going pretty well. Um, I think then at some point she sat me down right before my 11th birthday and said, I have breast cancer. And that was kind of the beginning of the, of the nightmare. You, you said that things were going well, or they seemed to be going well. And then I think you said your mother sat you down one day and informed you that you had, she had breast cancer. Correct. Yeah. On my 11th, uh, just before my 11th birthday, she sat me down and explained to me that she had breast cancer and, you know, that she was going to be going in for a surgery. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, she actually didn't say that she was going in for surgery. Uh, she said she may had a, she had a lump in her breast and that she may or may not have cancer and that we would know after the surgery. So I spent my 11th birthday sort of in that panic traumatic mode of, of wanting to know whether she had cancer or not. And then we found out that in fact she did have cancer and that she was going to be, uh, this, that, that, that they would remove the breast. And so, so I, I woke up sort of that next day realizing that my mother had already been, for lack of a better word, disfigured, um, you know, to see her in that situation and to realize that we had a very serious situation on our hands. And that was just kind of the beginning of the roller coaster. And those of us that, you know, are listening know, you know, the good news, bad news, good news, bad news, good news, bad news. You know, that's kind of was the start. And then at the age of 11, being very young to have to endure something like that. Yeah. I mean, and, and also the guilt that you feel of wanting to be normal, um, embarrassed, you know, you're dealing with other elements, the future of your own existence, where, where you're going to go, what's going to happen to your mother. Um, is it going to happen to me? I'm afraid to die. Uh, those are all, uh, pretty common, um, side effects from a ch child going through this experience. Yeah. So how, how did you wind up coping with it or, or like, were you left on your own to deal with it or were there people who came into the picture to help? I think that, you know, in hindsight, when I think about the organization Walk with Sally and what I started, it probably had to have had some elements of, of people that now I think back and I realize that, you know, why was that family uh, coming to the house and picking me up to take me out to pizza um, when I wasn't that close with their son in school? Mm. Why are they bringing me on that special trip uh, for a week? Why? Why are they giving me money? 
um, you know, little little stipend of money to have, you know, video games. Um, you started to see, uh, you know, my, my assistant director in the play I was in, uh, you know, spending the weekend with me in Half Moon Bay and wondering what, what was going on there, you know. And so it wasn't it wasn't formalized uh, like my mo- mentoring program is, but certainly had a lot of those ingredients of people. We didn't have a very big family, but those family members that we did have close by, I just remember them sort of in a fun way kidnapping me for the weekend. So how did these people find out about you in the first place? Uh, well, I mean, these are people that um, specifically that I just can remember, um, you know, in, are, you, are you referring to when I was a kid, how they found me? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was that people that had interactions with me that knew me and knew of the story. And again, when you're 11 or 12, you're not really sure how they know about your story, but they could be that you're, you know, going to school with their son and they hear that, oh, that little boy's mother has cancer and they say, boy, we should do something. Let's take him with us for a weekend excursion. Um, my assistant, um, a director for a play I was in must have known or seen my mom was sick and maybe had a conversation with her and said, Hey, I'd like to come in and grab him. So it was very much a, um, very, uh, unformalized. It was just that sort of random person who from time to time saw there was a problem and maybe decided. And I do remember thinking the attention was what they were trying to give me. Maybe it was to give my mom a break or maybe it was to give me a break, or, or, or both, right? But I don't know that, that there was any really formalized thing around it. Um, and, and so Walk With Sally, actually, the mentoring program ended up sort of being a byproduct of that, um, you know, formalizing that, that time with the child when they're going through trauma. Yeah. And as, as far as your mother is concerned, like over a period of time, as you said, you would get the good news, bad news, good news, bad news. And when did you get to a point where you realized that this wasn't going to end well? Uh, I'm, I, it's actually a great question you asked me. I think the beginning of the end was when she sat me down and told me I had to move to Idaho with a dad that I hadn't known very well, uh, who was out of the picture when I was one, and was in our lives in and out, but not a lot of time had had been spent with this person. And so my dad um, ultimately um, was told that, you know, th- that he needed to step in and help my brother and I because we were dealing with uh, the escalating health issues of my mother and, and what she needed for herself to get well. And, and I think sitting her sitting us down and saying you know you're not going to attend your eighth grade year here was kind of that oh god what's what's happening Mm -hmm. you know that was very traumatic uh i can remember crawling on the phone floor screaming yelling you know just sobbing you know and i think at some point she just sort of said you know you gotta you gotta stop (laughs) i just can remember being very very dramatic around that time I can't say I blame you. I, I don't. I can't think of anybody who would not be having an extreme reaction given the circumstances. I can't imagine how traumatic that would have been for you. It, yeah, it was because there were just so many things. I mean, on the on the on the small scale, it was what about my friends, right? Um, I don't know anybody in Idaho. Um, I don't know my dad very well, uh, and I don't know his family very well. So now cancer, we talk about the trauma of cancer and, you know, changes everything. And ultimately now you're faced with uh, a lot of other problems. Uh, <laughs> you know, where am I going to have, am I taking my dog, my little dog, Terrier, Nicole, with me? Am I, uh, you know, so just really escalates the anxiety. And were there any support people around you to help you with it, or did you just have to find a way to manage it on your own? I mean, I think in the mid-'80s, you know, everybody's go-to was probably therapy, and and there was a small attempt 
but again, I, I think the modus operandi was was to just kind of get in back into life and move there and you know work 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 it out um you know to get get into a class hopefully get active um i think i was much different than my brother in this in the fact that i chose even through the grief and the and the trauma to search out friendships and sports and activities i got very involved mm-hmm. my brother took a different path he was already somewhat of an introvert and um so I definitely sort of got into action with, uh, with, with not necessarily finding groups or organizations that would help me. Um, more just the, 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 the situation I was in was to, to quickly make friends. That was, that was the deal. This is the, biggest, yeah. this is the biggest message that we keep, keep hearing. that the, uh, It's the choice and the decision that gets made at a certain time on which path that you're going to take and where you ultimately end up. Um, I mean, clearly your brother made a choice too. You made different ones um, uh-huh. and different directions. So, yeah. I think, I think I agree with you. I think you bring up a really good point. I think the biggest issue with the way my brother dealt with it was that he's three and a half years older and I'm expecting him to be a, a level of support and unfortunately um, far from it. My brother became mm. very withdrawn, and um, I probably developed a lot of anger toward him for not being more protective of what I perceived as protective of my mother. Um, I, he seemed to be excited about leaving and going and, and living with my father, so he had a completely different take. Um, and he just appeared to, to not be the big brother. And I think siblings probably go through this a lot when I, you know, is, is this an expectation of what's the role going to be of my younger or older sibling? Yeah, and there's also the issue of being forced to grow up very, very quickly before your time, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, immediately, you know, you become very street, yeah, street smart, I think, which is, an, I think is really serve me as an entrepreneur um but it's uh yeah survival you know yeah, yeah and street smarts uh, i mean that comes with a price nick how, how long after moving to idaho did your mother pass away yeah so 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 we got there i, I started my eighth grade year and she died uh halfway through my sophomore year in high school and i had seen her um on several different occasions, either I was down there. I've read some letters recently that were pretty heartbreaking of how I sounded in that eighth, ninth grade year, those two years that were two and a half years before she died and, you know, the visits that we would have. But the letters that I wrote were pretty excruciating um, to get that, to see that angle you know, of your own letters mm-hmm. that you wrote when you were in high school. It's uh, it's heartbreaking because th- th- this is a little boy who really loved his mother mm-hmm. and 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 missed her and uh, and there 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 was a lot of trauma that yep. came from that separation. Yep. It's, um, yeah, I mean, your mother was a victim of the cancer. How how did you look at yourself as a victim in that space as well? You know, I think it brought up a lot of things around uh, a combo of a lot of things. When I said earlier, I mean, cancer changes everything. Mm -hmm. I think you had to break it down into things like living in now a combined family where my dad was on his third marriage. So, you know, you've got issues of divorce and then co-mingling with new stepbrother, stepsister. I mean, my stepmother killed my dog uh, the first year I got there because she felt she couldn't deal with him and made it look like it had ran away. And that was because she had a larger German shepherd. And I think my stepmother was probably losing her mind at that point because we had moved in. And this was the way that she responded. Mm. Um, 
which added a whole other dimension dimension of 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 conflict mm. in the family. So you're looking at um, when we work with kids, you know, oftentimes you're 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 you're, you're it's a multitude of, of elements that have come up now, right? Because you're you you find that divorce, unemployment, um, moving these impacts from cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, so these other problems multiply, you know, missing my friends back home that I had relationship with. I had a really strong, um, leadership, uh, role. I was building kind of a, a history or a community in, in, in the Bay area. And I was running for office and I was in plays and I was in the theater in San Francisco. So, you know, the, the loss is just so much greater than just the, the loss of your mother and the love of your mother. It's the loss of a lot of things. Mm. Um, so how did you deal with that? I think dealing with it, as I, as I sort of early on said, as I watched quickly how I became, in my mind, the, you know, I was going to be the most popular person or I was going to be the most <laughs> gregarious or I was going to be the funniest. I was going to surround myself with people who maybe needed a family environment, you know? Um, and, and so for me, it was watching a friend of mine whose dad was abusive and saying, you know, we need to stick together. And then another friend that, you know, I had a fairly safe environment now. I was living with a, a family and, and seemingly, you know, I, my dad was a nice person. And so, you know, there was some, so there's some positive things, but finding friendships that we could bond and we became inseparable. We spent every weekend together. There was about five to six of us that all had our own little thing going on, whatever that was, right? Just going through high school together, but we bonded. Um, and I created and learned how to create very long lasting, loyal friendships. Mm. Um, and that's been a trait of mine from that, that time. And I can even remember early on just, just clinging to those friendships. And that makes perfect sense too, because as I, as I've been discovering in my travels that it's really important to create high quality friendships and relationships, people who can not only help you, people you can help mm. and create. Yeah. to do, Because so many things that we encounter in our, in our modern world is in some cases, quote, throw away relationships but when you wind up in a situation yeah. like yours and you realize that those friendships those relationships are essential to your health and well-being yeah i totally agree i think that the other thing you notice well in the community we've created for walk with sally i think you're noticing that people are craving for some authenticity and when you can start to have something in common like the cancer story or another situation because we all have a story all of our stories define us and all of us have different stories and it's di different levels of trauma but really you know divorce for somebody else could have been a big deal just as much as it was for me going through mom with cancer frankly and my the frame of reference is something i think we need to always understand is is their frame of reference is totally different than your frame of reference and to see people wanting authentic relationships and to be real and say, hey, in a circle of people that are maybe becoming mentors, you know, tell us why you're here. Why do you want to help a child? And all of them are like, I'm still suffering from my experience dealing with cancer and I want to be able to like heal from it. And you immediately have a, a connection with somebody that's not your day-to-day -day average conversation that you're having with most of the people in your life. And so if you can have that ability to, to get real with people, um, early on in my life, I kind of realized that, that, we, that, that I was going to attract people that, that could be, and we're looking for something a little bit more of substance, right, in the friendship. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And it is something that we've been encountering on our shows as well, that need for authenticity, that need for being real, that need for being people who are willing to be raw and exposed as, as a way of dealing with various things, trauma, whatever it is. 
Well, so when I'm thinking about your, your organization, Walk With Sally, what led you to create it? I think that, that as a, an entrepreneur and living in Los Angeles, I started to look for you know meaningful ways to get involved with my community. And I think the thing that scared me the most was thinking that my mom had been gone for 16 years at 32 and I hadn't really mentioned her name and that her short life and dying at 44 of breast cancer and having two kids and d did it really mean anything? Was she all that, you know, pain and suffering and hard work that she went through to make sure that my brother and I were successful and that we had enough love and, and she did all those things, but to not have her, uh, even her name be mentioned uh, with my small family and my divided family, you just weren't having Sally conversations. And I think that, 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 that a lot of us that lose a parent or a lot of us that lose someone that we love are deathly afraid of them, their memory disappearing completely. We, we feel yeah. almost burdened by this idea that we have to keep their name alive. And some of us do better <laughs> jobs of keeping their name alive. And so I would say, you know, Sally was going to be sort of the, 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 the who is your Sally? The Sally is represents all moms and dads and loved ones that are struggling to raise a family while they're fighting, f fighting cancer. And so ultimately I was like, you know, how could I use my skills to not just make money, but to be the social entrepreneur and, and look at taking a good idea and helping other kids that were similar to what I'd gone through. I, I wanted to play soccer. I wanted to chase girls. I wanted to be in a play. I, I didn't. I didn't want to have a mom who was bald. Um, I already compared myself negatively by fourth or fifth grade because I didn't know very many parents that were mar that were divorced. So I was already kind of knowing that I was different. But you throw that cancer thing on there. Oh my God! You know, you spend a lot of time trying to hide it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would say that walk with Sally is just, it's a culmination of all of those feelings. And then ultimately saying like, how could we do something really, really great in her name and helping children? And then as we talked a little before we got on the air, how us helping kids started really realizing that the adults were the ones that wanted to be a part of this healing community, the healing to give back and yeah. for them to heal themselves. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And what, what you said earlier about the wanting to hide. And so when you, you were talking about not having Sally conversations, your mother had been gone all those years. And from what you were saying, not bringing it up, what were the reasons for not bringing her name up or anything of her during that time? I think that we, I lost contact with most people that knew her. I was not, you know, having a smaller family and then moving to Los Angeles. Anybody that knew her, it was further and further removed. I mean, even my friends in high school, moving to Idaho meant that, that, that none of them really knew my mother. Mm. And, and my dad was on his third marriage, so he's not going to have pictures around the house when I get home for Christmas, right? And there's not going to be a story, a fun story about Sally that he's going to tell around the campfire. Um, unfortunately, that just was not his way. Um, and my brother wasn't expressing himself. He never mentioned my mom's name at all. That so, would have hurt, I'm sure. I'm getting yeah. a sense of a lot of loneliness in your life. Yeah. It's, um, mm. And equally what you'd be... Um, the children that come through walking with Sally that you mentor, the you know, helping them to not be alone and building that trust and that safe place for them is hugely important for them to 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 have a lifestyle, to have something that's um, yeah. That was it a lonely place to be? Yeah, I mean, I, what I would tell you is again is is the power of resilience mm. and strength you know, the immediate ability for me to find friendships and cultivate very quickly a family. 
Mm. Right. I mean, I literally built my family out of these friendships yep. in eighth, eighth and ninth grade. I be, I ran for president of my junior high. I, you know, I mean, you name it. I was dating, you know, uh, the, the, the cutest girls. Uh, I mean, whatever I could do to, to, to be popular and have people like me. Um, the loneliness, I think, comes from that idea that some of that stuff gets stuffed down and you disconnect from it. And I think that my saying in the program is every child wants to be known and every child needs to be known. And when cancer hits the family, uh, the kids oftentimes are, are the first to sort of have to be set to the side, um, not always intentionally, just the way things start to happen. And, and they start to just not have that attention and not have that hands-on special um, you know, um, parenting and, and, and oversight and they start to make decisions. And, and sometimes those aren't always good decisions. And mm -hmm. so we start to see, uh, this loneliness that you describe translating into, I don't matter. Uh, my behavior and my choices maybe become destructive. Um, I know I was really having fun. Um, a, turned to uh, at a very young age drinking um very social to be in idaho in the 90s was perfectly acceptable to be drinking beer as long as you weren't driving a car you know you got your license at 14 in idaho mm. so things were very loose um so it made it very easy to 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 socialize with alcohol and 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 i was really independent my dad was not prepared to, to, to be managing me. Uh, so I was gone on the weekends. I was a boy. We were living, you know, in a pretty free society in Idaho. You could go away for the weekend to a cabin with your friends and have a good old time. <laughs> yep. So, so we did, you know, so we did and it yep. was fun. It was a lot of fun and, and I don't regret it at all, but it was certainly, mm -hmm. uh, there, there was not a lot of parenting. And, mm. uh, and I think what we try to do at Walk With Sally is say, hey, you matter. We're going to show up. And um, we're going to hopefully know you for a lifetime. And we're going to pay attention. And we're going to see uh, that, you, that, you, uh, that you expect more from yourself no matter what happens to your mom or whatever, whatever your story is, right? Because yep. we've got so many different cancer stories in our organization. Mm. Yeah, and that's the biggest message that you have for these children as they come through and sort of helping them. To get... oh, where, where do you actually start with them? Like, do the do the children how how do they find you, and where do you start with them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I find that we are really our best place to to start the relationship is through the schools, uh, the teachers, and the counselors. They, they're they typically the first to really know yep. something's going on. Um, the hospitals are a little more difficult because there's not a pipeline of communication um, necessarily that, oh, you've got kids and what are we going to do for them? Unfortunately, I don't, I don't think that, that even hospitals have fully, mm. and there's probably some exceptions, but they haven't fully looked at all angles of a person when they're being diagnosed. Um, they're really focused on how do we, you know, eradicate cancer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, walk with Sally is really invested in the impact that cancer has on the family. And so we meet them through the, the, the counselors and, or the, 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 the teachers, um, who say, uh, you know, walk with Sally already has a, an existing relationship with us. We've worked with walk with Sally and we recommend that you, um, contact them. I'd like to give them your information. And then we set up an in-service. Um, we have a lot of bilingual situations where we where we have you know Spanish speaking and and uh, English speaking, and so we we're, we're we're always coming sort of looking at the household and, and and assessing what what are the needs. And so at that point, we'll make the decision: is this the right time for this family to introduce an adult? That adult who gets introduced as a mentor has been trained and through our our program to be a mentor and, and about grief and has had their own experiences shared. Um, and so by the time they get matched, they're gonna be matched with a child. Yep. Um, 
their experience is is the thing that we all share. You know that that, that hey, your new buddy, he he has a mom that uh, that was sick and, and did die, and um, but he 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 grew up to be you know happy and helpful and you know all of those things. So having a buddy that you can emulate that's mm. gone through the same experience is the concept and knowing it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. So. There's hope. There's yeah. hope. Oh my God, there's hope. Which is so important to getting, getting through something like this, regardless <clears throat> of where it goes. So, so for people, those, those people who are listening to us in our broadcast, they want to get any more information about you and walk with Sally. How would they find it? Yeah, really, really easy. Walkwithsally.org. Um, walk with Sally, all one word. And um, you really have an opportunity to just check into a community of people who have said, I'm not going to let my story define me. And I always tell people that for a long time I thought I was the boy who lost his mom to cancer. And I took that into my 20s and my 30s. And you know, ten years after starting the organization, I know now I'm I'm a man who's helping children mm. and other adults um, go through that experience and heal. Actually, heal because I see a lot of people that are in their fifties and sixties that have not fully healed from this experience that maybe happened thirty years ago, forty years ago. It it makes perfect sense. Mm. I mean, when you've lost somebody in in a way to cancer or to something else. Uh, where it could be very traumatic, it is it is possible not to heal. It is possible to be stuck. And mm -hmm. with an organization like yours, you would be able to give them different resources for healing that they would not have had otherwise. Uh, I totally agree. And I think sometimes it happens organically by being a part of a community where all of a sudden people are freely sharing and that it's okay to say, yeah, my mom died of cancer. Boy, when I sit with a group like I did last Saturday, I had nine people in my um, mentor training, and I think four or five of them, when I told them I, I was going to share my story and then talk about why why I'm here and then have them go around the room, I must have had four people that said, I haven't told this story since it happened. And just being able to share your story, oh my God, it's so easy, it's so simple, but yet there's a lot of people that stuff that down and never told their story again. And by just asking them, what is the name of your mom who died? What is the name of your dad who died? Because they say, well, my dad, or well, my mom, or my sister, or my brother died. I said, what's the name? They say, ah, oh, Gary, or, you know, Lisa. And you can just see there's something that just kind of opens Let's up. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And that they're honoring them. You know, honoring them is a big part of our healing. It's so very important it, when people stuff things, it, there isn't the opportunity for it to heal and it can cause so many problems at a later date, for sure. Mm. And, you know, the other, the other thing, too, is that when you lose somebody who's very precious to you, sometimes, at least my own experience where I lost somebody I really cared about, I simply couldn't deal with it for a very long time. And I just got work and busy and everything. And then after I got sick a couple of times and the better part of a year had passed, then I was ready to look at it. Mm. Then I was ready to deal with it. Yeah, and, and I don't think some people know how. You know, what does that even absolutely, look like? To deal absolutely. Absolutely. Sure, of course. Which is why people get stuck. And it's natural and it's normal and it's also heartbreaking. Well, even just sharing with you guys tonight and sharing with the audience, it's – it, it is when you're when you're sharing and, and 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 I'm able to share with other people like I told you on Saturday imagine being able to freely just talk about this idea that you know I still miss my mom after these years and to be able to just share freely and to have people around you that really like really will let you share if it comes up is so important. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, just like us doing this right now, you know, last week I was talking to nine people who all had a story who 50% of them hadn't shared it in 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. So sh sh finding places to share, I think for anyone that's listening, you know, who can I really confide in and share? That's really the first place to say, you know what? 
I miss my mom. She's been dead for five years. I have a lot of people that say, well, I'm 42. I'm not, I shouldn't, I shouldn't feel this way. I'm like, says no. who? <laughs> you know, you got to share that stuff, you know, and, and... says, says who, I mean, <laughs> I lost my closest friend when I was, uh, 29 years old. That was a long time ago. And when I think of him, I definitely miss him a lot. He was like a brother to me and, and losing him for my life was very painful. And what yeah. I've noticed about grief, at least from my own experience is that you move on life moves you on sooner or later if you let life do that but do you forget do you stop caring no the caring's still there yeah i agree what was your friend's name jeff fisher <laughs> nice nick yeah <laughs> yeah yeah now um, it's so, alive for me yeah <laughs> yeah he was he was a really good friend to me and he was like a brother to me and he um uh, didn't die through cancer, he died through suicide, and I would have given anything to help him. And to to speak of some of this here, I mean, I, normally I wouldn't speak about this kind of thing, but in the context of what we're talking about, uh, I went through survivor's guilt, I went through all this stuff, and really questioning myself for a very long time about this, and I, and I finally realized that there was nothing I could have done I, no matter what I had done or said, I wouldn't have been able to save him. I was 700 miles away in a different city. And when I started to realize these different things as a way of talking to myself about it, I was able to move through my grief of it. But do I forget him? No. Do I still care about him? Yes. Do I wish he had never died? Of course. And would I? And I would have given anything to help him, and I knew I couldn't. And I also knew that it wasn't my fault, nor was it anybody yeah, else's that's... fault. It was just the way things were. And to be able to forgive yourself through something like this is so important. Have you been able to forgive Jeff? Yeah, I just, I, I understand what happened, or at least I think I do. And he, he did, he did what he did. I mean... What am I going to say? I mean, I just miss him. Yeah. And um, sometimes quite a bit. My turn to feel some emotion now. I mean, he was like a brother to me. He was someone I cared about a great deal. I loved him more than the members of my family. And when I lost him for my life, it, it really hurt a lot. So I really can't appreciate what you're saying and where you're coming from. Yeah. My reasons are different, but it's still loss. And I still yeah. have a memory of it. Him. With a, yeah, yeah, yeah. And to, to share it with a stranger tonight is pretty cool. I am far more open than I ever used to be when I was younger. I've learned that. I've had to, it's like what you talk about with the resiliency. I've had to train myself. I've had to force myself. I've had to get out and do different things. This is how I met Hamish as a result of that kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, anyway... I really want to thank you for being on our show, for being a part of our audience, for sharing your story. Yep. Well, thanks for giving us a platform, both of you. Uh, just a platform for, to honestly, for people who don't know each other to, to share and for people to hear it. Hopefully they hear something in themselves and you talk about training yourself. You know, I probably trained myself as well in a certain way to, to be much more open to this because it, it ultimately will, will kill you. And the, you got to heal. And uh, so it's great that you guys created a platform to, to, to share and, and to get the word out about organizations that are making, uh, making things right. And, um, and there's a lot of them out there yeah. that are dealing specifically yeah. with the impacts. So thank you. Thank you. You're most welcome. So for those of you who have been listening to us, my name is Nathan Siegel. I'm here with my colleague Hamish Baston out of Australia. We are the Thought Hackers. And with us tonight has been Nicholas Arquette. And thank you very much for listening to us. And we will be with you soon in another broadcast. You've been listening to the Thought Hackers. Make sure you subscribe and get each new episode emailed straight to you so you don't miss a show. 
and have a look at our resources page where you will find programs, audios and books that will create change in your thoughts.